for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, ain't no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in to win. We're gonna give everything. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. On fire, we're ready to fight. We'll bring the house down tonight. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. S-I-C-K is the sickest. them on blast, we don't give no hot takes, only talk back, S-I-C-K, 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 all in, we came in to win, we're gonna give everything, S-I-C-K, on the run, S-I-C-K, it's the sickest podcast Tune it for the audio Or you can even watch back Giving players all the props Or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes Only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah Cause this is our time No, we no stopping us Till we reach the finish line All in, we came in a can hold it down shout out to my man sammy got it off the ground and to all the listeners tuned in right now got debates analysis and speculation this is sports talk for the new generation you know where to find us got a reputation sick podcast your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion riding high on this wave of emotion going all out yeah because this is our time no, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in to win. We're gonna give everything. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. On fire, we're ready to fight. We'll bring the house down tonight. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. S-I-C-K is the sick. them on blast, we don't give no hot takes, only talk back, S-I-C-K, 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 Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast, The Eye Test, with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Moore! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. And welcome to another edition of the Eye Test here on the Sick Podcast Network. He's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. Back in our home studios after a wonderful and successful time. What a great time, Pierre, we had over at the Tap Sports Bar inside the MGM Casino prior to the UMass Denver Instant Classic, I will say. Uh, a double overtime win for the University of Denver over the University of Massachusetts. And then Cornell beat Maine in the second game. But Pierre, let's just talk a bit about our time there. Man, I really enjoyed myself there. A great turnout by all the mostly UMass fans, but I saw some UMaine fans, saw a couple Cornell fans trickle in as well. Uh, just a good environment all together in Springfield yesterday. It was fantastic. The ambiance was amazing. Uh, first of all, thanks to Jeanette and her team over at the TAP. They were fantastic. Everybody was phenomenal there. Yep. The, food, the food was really good, too. Yes, it was. <laughs> the food was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, but just the electricity in the building was amazing. And I'm not talking about the arena. I'm talking about it at the tap. Mm -hmm. uh, the crowd, the UMass alumni were phenomenal. The UMass fans were great. Um, I know we had some stragglers from different universities there, but they were they were outstanding as well. I think the biggest thing is just getting to meet the people, Jimmy, and talking to them and, and yes. seeing the passion for hockey. It was really cool. And then obviously being at both games yesterday, um, the only knock I would say on both games, and I think it affected the outcome in both games, mm -hmm. whether it was positive or negative, was the condition of the ice. Yes. That's the one that's, that's the only thing that I watched yesterday that I said, is there anything that could be better? And I'd say, yep, there's one thing that could be better, the condition of the ice. Everything else was aces. Phenomenal. Yeah. In yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And that's not, we're not blaming no. a win or a loss on it, but no. there's no denying it played a role. And I, I think that a lot, there was a lot in the, in the game, the, U, um, the UMass Denver game specifically, Pierre, uh, it just was, the puck was bouncing everywhere. And also too, a lot of guys taking dingers and spills everywhere. It was, it was tough. It was, uh, but it, it was bringing back some some memories, though, of being in the old barns back in the day, you know, whether it was the old Boston Garden, what have you, or even in that same arena, Pierre, where you spent a lot of time uh, when you were coach of the Whalers and, and their minor league team, the AHL team, was in uh, Springfield at the spring, what was then Springfield Civic Center, now the Mass Mutual Center. But, yeah, just a great time. I want to thank uh, John, the GM, as well oh, there great, at yeah. the top. I want to thank uh, Ryan Bamford. Uh, Ryan Bordenay from UMass, uh, Mike Merchant, who joined us as well. What a great guy he was. Small world that he knows Joe Mullen so well. Pierre, that was uh, that was pretty cool. Really cool. Um, and just a, a really good time. And Pierre, I I left early. I will. I'm not going to claim to be there. I was not there for the second game. I went and caught up with some friends I haven't seen in years. Uh, good. It was great catching up to them too as well. I want to give a shout out to Brian Pratt and his girlfriend uh, Jen. But uh, you know that first game, Pierre. Look, uh, UMass hung. They they really did. They slowed down. Uh, uh, and now we could say the ice slowed down too. But UMass's structure, I thought, played a role in getting that game as far as it went. Um, and just it's one of those things, you know, over time, anything can happen. And you kept saying the further we went, you kept saying over to me, looking at me and saying fatigue is setting in here and somebody's going to make some mistakes. And sure enough, that's what happened. And that's usually how it ends in a long game like that. I had such a nice conversation with Coach Carvel uh, when I was driving back to Boston from Springfield. And, and what a gentleman. The way he carried himself, he said, look, Denver played great. We played really well. I was really happy with our plan. I was happy with the way our players followed through on the plan. Uh, we were physical and we had to be. We were disciplined. We couldn't capitalize. We had tons of chance. We just couldn't put the puck to the back of that. But he said, we left it out there. I was really proud of all our players. I, I thought that was really a nice way for Greg to handle things. Um, and then I spoke to some NHL people because um, it's about an hour and a half, but last night was a little longer because of the rain. And I uh, talked to some NHL people. And the, the one thing that I came away with from how they saw the game between Denver and UMass is UMass dictated the physical part of the game and they dictated the speed part of the game. And Denver probably dominated a little bit more of the skill part of the game. And yep. then both goalies were about equal. So it was really neat to see and hear, um, you know, the way people viewed it. And then obviously Maine and, and Cornell, Jimmy, I, I remember telling you, this ice is going to be very conducive to Cornell in the way they play. We called it. And it's going to hurt Maine. 
and Cornell, to their credit, they fell behind one nothing, and yeah. he and Shane had to make about mm, three to five saves when Cornell took a five minute major penalty, and that was a swing moment of the game. That was a huge swing moment. Shane was phenomenal. He was yep. phenomenal on goal, and then you could see Cornell started to reel in and they started dominating physically. Board play became apparent. Slot area play became apparent. Dump and chase, and Cornell's so good at that. Mike Schaefer deserves a huge pat on the back by the Cornell faithful. He he coached a brilliant game. He and his assistants, Sire and Flanagan, really coached a brilliant game. I don't have it. I'm just I'm just uh, I'm not. This isn't verbatim what Ben uh, Ben Byer said after the game uh, about Schaefer, but he he said something to the extent of. Look, when I was young and playing, and you know, he was still doing the same things he is today. And for him to still be able to do that today and be successful and yet adapt at the same way. So keep pretty much what he's trying to say is like he keeps his foundation of his coaching style, but he adapts to the game as it as it advances. And he said it's just amazing. And he, you know, he said, Look, this guy's one of the best coaches ever in the history of college hockey. And uh, I can't I can't disagree with him. And Pierre, I said it to you too. Like I I got this feeling about Cornell. They're just they're just playing the right type of hockey at the right time of year. And I, I definitely could see them beating Denver tomorrow. Uh, I think they could pull out of this region, but I think it's going to be a hell of a game either way. They beat Denver last year in New Hampshire. That's right. Denver That's right. It's already year. been done once. Eventually they lost to BU, but they took Denver out. Um, you're right about Mike and, and Coach Barr deserves a huge amount of credit for what he did with his team for Maine. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting there to see whether Bradley Nadeau leaves mm -hmm. Carolina or if he stays. And again, just so the listeners understand and the viewers, I was talking to Jim. I said, see that play there? That That's why this guy's got a chance to be in the NHL. It's not the whole body of work. It's just certain mechanisms that he's able to perform that makes him an NHL player. He does things at such a high rate of speed. His peripheral vision is phenomenal. Um, and the thing to me that makes him so good is if you play – let's just say for the sake of argument – you put him on a line with Sebastian Ajo. I'm just using him as one example. Yes. Um, I'm going to say that he's probably going to score 30 to 40 goals. Like wow. that's, so that's just – you. Uh, he, now, Sebastian Ajo is a unique player. You know, he's not – there's not an Ajo on every team. No. But he's drafted by Carolina. Yeah. And that's where Ajo plays. And I'm just saying he's not going to be on the ice at the end of a game defending a one-goal lead. Talking about yeah. Bradley Nadeau, he's going to be on the ice getting your goals yep. and getting your points. So, you know, I was really impressed by him this entire season. Um, I was really an undersized guy, but Lyndon Breen for Maine really impressed me a lot. Um, Harrison Scott impressed me a lot. There's a lot to like what Coach Barr's done at Maine, but you could see in that game they weren't ready to play at that level physically mm -hmm. that that Cornell was. You could yeah. you could just see that. Pierre, who was the player? I, I forgive me for forgetting the player, but during the Denver UMass game, um, I think it was a De it was the Denver it was a Denver defenseman, and he did a great clear. He sensed the pressure coming, and he got the it puck. Was out. It was brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, and you said, "Hey, that that right there is an NHL, NHL play." play. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I remember John's that. backhand on bad ice, people all around him. Yep. Total composure, spin around, up yep. and out. That's that was impressive. It was, was huge really because impressive. they were they were buzzing right then. They were really buzzing, and then it was a great clear by him. Uh, Pierre, looking around at the other scores, too, BU pulls away 6-3 on RIT. Uh, it's pretty much what we expected there. Uh, credit to RIT for a great season there, and BU advances. Minnesota, now look, they, we both agreed. Omaha is a sneaky good team, and you know it wasn't getting a lot of love from people around the country, specifically on the networks carrying this tournament. Uh, they gave Minnesota all they could handle, and uh, Minnesota though pulled away three two, and won that game. Um, you look at that now, BU Minnesota. It's just there's some great matchups forming up as we go on here. I, I'm really excited as this tournament goes on. Right now, by the way, Boston College is up four to one. They pulled away on Michigan Tech. There's actually been a couple fights as we speak. So, but I just got to talk about that game for a second. Let, let's no, You know what? Let's finish up on Omaha and Minnesota. Then we'll yep, go. And then we'll get to the current times. Yep. Yeah. So finish up on Minnesota. No, just my, my take was I, I think Omaha, like I, I love the way they played in their conference tournament. And I loved how competitive they were last night as well. I think they deserve a lot of credit. 
I mean, Minnesota was supposed to win, but and that's not to take away anything from Minnesota. I just think Omaha deserves some props uh, for the valiant effort they had. No, we agree. They, they, they have an identity how they play. They're big on defense. They're really physical. They move the puck. Not great. They move it okay. Um, but they know that. They know what they have. So they're yeah. smart about it. They're not making 80-foot stretch passes. You know what I mean, they're, they're really yeah. in tight support when they come out of their own zone. So they're, well, they're extremely well coached, talking about Omaha. Minnesota had too much. The grad students obviously stepped up, Nelson yeah. in particular. So that was impressive. They got to close at the end. That No pun intended, the goalie from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, there were some really close opportunities against close, and he made, I'm going to say, three or four elite saves uh, in the last two and a half minutes of that game last night. Yeah. Um, but no, Minnesota, I, I'm not surprised. Bobby Motzko is our friend, and we think the world of Bobby you and I, and, and I respect him a ton. And I think he's coached really well with this team. I know there's some doom and gloomers in Minnesota. You guys got to back off. This guy's coached really well, and he's been through some pretty adverse conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and that those kids play for him. They play hard for him. Uh, the reaction after the game was really impressive on the yeah. bench. Yeah, I was really happy about that. For Minnesota, I felt bad for the guys from uh, Omaha. But Minnesota B is going to be an interesting game. Uh, I would say the one thing, Neither, only one team has Macklin celebrating. Yep. Okay. Only one team has him. I'm going to come at you from another end, though, and say only one team has Bob Motzko. And I yeah, think okay, but Jay, the experience cool. there is huge. It is, but I'm going to tell you, Jay's coached a ton of NHL yeah. games, and he's been to a Stanley Cup final as a player and won, and he's been yeah. to a Stanley Cup final as a coach, and he's lost. Bob Motzko has never been there. Yeah, the world. Bob Mosco's biggest dance has been the World Junior in Montreal, where he was head coach and he won a gold medal. Yep, so it's a lot different than coaching the Stanley Cup final or playing in the Stanley Cup final. I'll just tell you that. So I don't. Yeah. As much as I, you know what I think of Bob. I, I think that's a soft between him and Pandora. Okay. I think it's a okay. soft. But what I will say though is that Celebrini, they better have a plan because mm. I think this guy is going to rocket ship tomorrow. I do. Yeah going to rocket ship which is a huge thing it's it's so it, it's so fun though Pierre seeing like someone his age uh understand moments you know like we know we all know he's skilled we get how skilled he is we know what a great player he is but his ability to understand big moments I mean even in that game when most of his team didn't have it and they lost to BC in the hockey East final he was still pretty good yeah. and he you could, you could see him elevating Unfortunately, his team didn't do it with him, but his, just his ability to to seize the moment and, and understand this is what I play for. This is what it all it's all about. I think it's so great to watch. No, that's well said, and I agree with that, Jimmy, 100%. Um, the other part is I don't know how much you had a chance to watch of it because I know how busy you've been, but uh, you got another job too covering the Bruins. I get it. Uh, <laughs> Lane Hudson. Lane Hudson. Oh, yeah. Is, you know. He's really good, Jimmy. I yeah. know, again, doom and gloomers. Oh, he's too small. He don't focus on what he doesn't do. Focus yeah. on what he does do. Exactly. First goals. He makes the players around him better. He can break the puck out tape to tape, unlike most call it. The last guy I saw really do it like him is Adam Fox. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and before Adam Fox, you know, the last guy I saw do it like that, Brian Leach. So, yeah. I mean. Wow. I'm just telling you, know, break the puck out. I'm not like, Fox, uh, Hudson can't do what Brian does. He can't. Yeah. Brian is mean, a Hall of Famer. You know, let's see Lane Hudson play one game before we, you know, label him a Hall of Famer. But he breaks the puck out tape to tape. There are not a lot of guys in the league that can do that. In any of the leagues, you can do that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, good stuff. Pierre, all right, let's get to current times right now. As we speak, yeah. there is a game going on in Providence, Boston College, Michigan Tech. Yep. Uh, Michigan Tech. You know, they, they, came up they, should up, they should have been up after the first 20 minutes, four to one. Jacob Fowler saved Boston College's bacon. Okay. He did. He they did. Had another way. They were frozen. BC's kids were frozen. They were losing mm -hmm. stops. They were losing physical battles. They were losing puck possession. Like, unlike any tech I've seen this year on them, they mm -hmm. were losing puck possession. And Jacob Fowler bailed them out. Yeah. He, he, he was outstanding. Yeah, he was. I want to. Pinpoint. I don't know if you were able to see it. It was right as we were coming on. BC scored their third goal. I don't know if you have it on there with you while you're waiting to come on. But it was such a great play by Malone. It was a, it was a dump in by BC. 
And it looked like the Michigan Tech player thought maybe it was going to be icing, maybe, but he just wasn't hustling quite enough back. And you just see Malone, he's coming in like a, like a heat seeking missile. And he just goes right around him, gets the puck, rings around the net, tries to get it in front, misses. It comes back to him. He gets it back in front and they score. And it's just like, wow, that was some hustle there. And I, I don't, you know more about him as a player. Is that one of his trademark, uh, that he just hustles like that. I watched him a lot because he used to play at Cornell. He was okay. a Cornell. That's right. he was, yeah, so right. Cornell Colgate over the last three years played seven times. I saw him play a lot. Yeah, he's a Vancouver draft pick. He's really been well trained. He plays with a lot of energy. He's a nice kid. I believe he's from the state of New Jersey. Yep. Um, but what I would say about Jack is he's uh, he's a perfectly positioned player at Boston College right now, just like he was when he was playing for Mike. He's got a lot of energy. He's gritty. He can win face-offs, uh, but he's got a really good awareness around the opposition that really does. And, you know, he's a mid-round pick for Vancouver. I don't know how that's going to play out or not. He ended up being a grad student at BC mm -hmm. this year, but I've watched him play a lot of games. i got a lot of respect for the way he plays and carries himself on the ice. And it, it just kind of it was a, you know, talking big picture when we come to Boston College, Pierre, it kind of just reminded me of how much Greg Brown has them buying yeah. in. I mean, yeah, they've got all the skill in the world, the most skill in the country. Yeah. Yeah. But you can have all the skill in the world. And if your, your team as a whole isn't buying in and your, you know, your bottom six guys aren't doing what they got to do, sometimes that skill's not going to matter, especially at this time of year. So that that to me just was a s symbol of the job that Greg Brown has done with those kids. You know, it really impressed me when ESPN Booth did an interview with Brownie in the second period. Oh, I was going to bring that up. It wasn't looking good, Jimmy. It wasn't. And he was what? But he was calm. He was measured. He was intelligent. Yep. And you kind of – so one of the key parts of doing those interviews, take people where they want to be and never had a chance to be. Uh -huh. So to their credit, ESPN – the booth up top, Brownie's answers took people to the bench. Right. And allowed people to understand how the coach was in a difficult moment. Exactly. So some people would have been like, Rrr! other people would have been like Brownie, really calm. Right. And so they take on the identity. I think BC takes on the identity of their coach. And yeah. because of that interview, you got a real good sense of why they're so good. They're not, they're unflappable basically is what they are. I mean, he, it was like he was doing an interview just sitting here with us on the eye test, like when he was on, that's, that's how comfortable he seemed in that moment. And I'm like, this guy's like numb. Like he's just numb to everything around him right now. It was great. You know, I, I had a chance to coach against him when he was a player at Boston college. I had a chance to coach against him when he played in the NHL. I watched him play in the Olympics. You know, the last time I saw him play is playing pro hockey in Sweden. Mm -hmm. That's the last time I saw him play. And um, live, yeah. And he was always such a smart, aware player. He made everybody around him better because he was smart and he was aware. And I think yep. he coaches the same way. I really do. You do too. And hey, by the way, before we forget, uh, just going back to our Springfield trip it was really great. Both of us got to catch up with the with Larry Plo, who's just oh, a yeah. great hockey guy. And I know you have a history with him. And I. I know him from uh, growing up, uh, going to a beach house in Seabrook, New Hampshire. You had a house next door. It was really nice to see him. I had an, I don't think I've seen Larry for like five years, Pierre. Uh, so it was, it was just wonderful <laughs> catching up with him. Yeah, uh, we had some good trips to Europe together. Um, we obviously coached in the league a long time, both of us. Uh, he, he was, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Montreal, he was one of the first American guys to play for the Canadians. He wore yep. number eight. He wore number eight. He's a kid from the North Shore of Boston. I think he, Linfield, 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 yeah, I think he was from Linfield, yeah. Um, and he was a really good player. I don't, you see how big he is. I mean, Jimmy, he, oh, yeah. I mean, he was a giant. Like, he wasn't yep. a small man. He was a big man. What I like about Larry is um, he tells the truth. Yeah. He's really passionate about the game, but he cares about people. Yeah. He really cares about people. So yes. this is a good story for you. I know Finland's not known for their pizza. They're just mm -hmm. not. It's okay. They make good food. It's not, it's not like having a piece of pizza somewhere else, like New York or Detroit or Chicago or Boston or maybe even Italy. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> just, exactly. 
<laughs> so Larry and I were over in Ivaskila, Finland. Ivaskila is north. It's about two and a half hours north of Helsinki. And we were watching a tournament there. And there was one player that was really good, really good. I'll tell you his name at the end. Okay. And uh, Larry and I didn't talk about players. We were just hanging out in the rink. And he says, let's go get some meat. So we went and had a piece of pizza. Or a pizza not a piece, but a pizza. At this pizza, we had in Oscar, Finland. And, it, and actually, I'm telling you, it was really good. It was That's awesome. Really good. Comparing notes, talking about players. We were both working for different teams. And I said, there's this guy. He's playing for the Czech Republic. He's really good, but he's kind of small, but I think he could get big. And he goes, don't tell me it's that Elias kid. I go, no, his name's Elias. He goes, no, his name's Elias. <laughs> so we, That's totally Larry. <laughs> you know, it was Patrick Elias. We were both watching him, and it was pretty – he was good. He was – back then, he was super good. Oh, yeah. yeah, we actually – I got to uh, – when Larry was – Larry was working with the Rangers when they won the Cup in 94. Yeah, and uh, he brought the cup to Seabrook on his deck there, and we got to take. Oh, it was great. It was really good. He did it again. Actually, I wasn't there this time, but when St. Louis won it, he was working with St. Louis in 2019. He did the same thing. So he's he's a legend in the uh, the beach towns of Seabrook and Hampton uh, Beach. There, I recruited his son Stephen to play for me. Oh, I love Steve. For school. He's working yep. for Calgary now. I try to work yep. recruit him to Babson, just so you know when I was coaching yeah. Babson. He wound up going to UNH, right? Yeah, absolutely, he did. Good defenseman. Yep. 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 Good stuff. But um, God, you know, at the pro level, real good job. All right. Well, Pierre, let's go back just quickly to the tournament here, and then we'll, we'll turn our eyes to some NHL action from from last night, and then look ahead to the weekend. Uh, so you got, as we said, well, BC is just really pulling away right now as we speak. About six minutes left in the third, BC is up six to one. Yeah. So it looks like BC will advance to the regional final there. The next the game. Winner, I'll play the winner of Wisconsin, Quinnipiac. That's exactly. And Pierre, you've been on saying people, I, and you make a great point considering they are the defending champs. A lot of people are not talking about Quinnipiac right now. Um, a lot of people just, I see online and in, in, in the brackets, by the way, thanks to everyone that filled out the brackets. We'll talk about that a little more. Um, a lot of people got involved with that, so that was really exciting. But a lot of people had Wisconsin going ahead. Um, but, Pierre, you never sleep on players that have the heart of champions and that can win a championship. Don't ever sleep on them. I don't no, care. What it's, it's fair. It's fair. My, the only concern I have is last weekend when Quinnipiac lost to St. Lawrence, they only had 22 shots on that. Now, part of that was St. Lawrence was really good in the faceoff dot. Um and Max Dorrington in particular, uh, and Boyer, Josh Boyer, those were the two guys from St. Lawrence that really impressed me in the faceoff circle. Boyer's already playing in the East Coast Hockey League, and Dorrington's gone in the portal, so yep. he's going to go somewhere else to play college hockey. Um, but those two guys dominated faceoff, so that made a big difference for St. Lawrence. But they only had 22 shots, Jimmy. Quinnipiac, I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and Graf, Colin Graf had zero, mm. zero shots. And – you know, he was a player of the year in the ECAC. He had zero shots. That can't happen. Like, if that happens if that happens today, they're going to get wiped out by Wisconsin. They're not just going to get beat. They, if those top guys there, um, you know, Quillen and, and Graf only have, let's say, two shots between the two of them, they got no chance of winning. They're in big trouble. They're in big trouble. All right, so that one's coming up at 530. Uh, Pierre, then at, at 4 o'clock Central, so that would be – Five our time uh, in the East here, Western Michigan and Michigan State yep. uh, in the Midwest Regional. Uh, what does Michigan State have to do to win that game? Because I don't think Western Michigan either. You know, we talk about teams maybe people are sleeping on. They're, you've mentioned them already. So they could surprise as well. Yeah, I think they could be the big dark horse. Now, the biggest thing that they have to go up against talking about Western Michigan, the Broncos from Kalamazoo is uh, Trey Augustine. I think. You know, Fowler and Augustine are the two best goalies in college hockey, in my my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are other people would say other goalies, but I think they're the two best. I agree. Um, you know, Fowler's maybe a year or two away from being in the NHL. I think Augustine probably much the same. Um, he was a second round pick of Detroit. So, in order for Western to win that, they got to figure out Augustine early because if he gets in the game, and you saw it at the World Junior this year when USA won gold, when he comfortable in the game it's a problem for the opposition. Yeah. So that's where a kid like Sam Colangelo, who transferred after three years at Northeastern, he plays at Western Michigan. He's got to bring the heat. You know, he had a big year this year. I think he had 25 or 26 goals, which is 
a whack of goals in college hockey. That's a yeah, ton of goals. Sure. Yeah. If you if you score more than ten goals a year in college hockey, that's a lot of goals. You're doing something really well. You're doing yeah. something really well. Trust me, it's yeah. really hard to get to the ten goal mark. Um, so that's going to be the biggest thing in that game. If they can't get to Augustine early, I think Michigan State is in good shape. But if they do get to Augustine early, then I think Western's going to be in good shape. So if Michigan State does advance, they do have the chance to face their in-state rival, yeah. the University of Michigan, who, Pierre, you know, and you touched on this, I don't know if it was uh, this week or last week. Uh, no, it was this week. It was earlier this week. Just talking about, like, this is the first time when when Michigan has entered the NCAA tournament. They're not doing it with all these drafted players and these prospects and everything. And this is the first time they they don't have a lot of hype around them, right? Like yeah, there's no Fanti like Fantilli's not there. It's right. just you know uh, Owen Powers not there. Matty Beneers isn't there. Like there's no yes, they're really good players. Like Gavin Brindley's a really good player, but Luke exactly. Hughes isn't there. I'm just saying they're, they're guys that are good players that are there, but they're not like a star, a plus, top five picks in the draft. They're just mm -hmm. not. Yeah mean that they're bad they're good they had a good team oh, yeah you know to me that's just shocking is and i get it it's such an ungrateful position to be in or a thankless position is probably a better way to term it if you if you're on the NCAA selection committee for the hockey imagine having to set up north dakota and michigan in the first game of a regional i know i know on, that's just you know it's well, it's like the Western Conference yeah, in the yeah, NHL. Yeah, they do it. Like it's, I totally understand it. It's not their fault. Here's what I do know. I talked to some friends from Dakota. Mm -hmm. The rink they're playing in in St. Louis, they're only 2,500 seats. I've been told by friends of mine from Dakota, and I hope they have pictures of this, that the tailgating outside will have more people from Dakota than people that will actually be in the building because they couldn't get oh tickets. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I'm telling you, like they came, there's like an RV run. So they're gonna they're gonna, they're gonna set up the screen. Maybe I don't know what they're gonna yeah. do. I'm just telling you, like I, I, you know, I've been there a lot. My oh yeah, you told me about it. We own yeah. land. And we used to own a lot of land in North Dakota, and and so I like a lot of people. I like going there. You know, mm -hmm. I really enjoy my time there, especially in Grand Forks and East Grand Forks. I have different spots I like to go. Just so, just again, so people understand the geography lesson. The Red River runs right between the state of Minnesota and the state of North Dakota. And on exactly. one side is East Grand Forks, and that's in Minnesota. And one side is West Grand or Grand Forks, not West. It's what it's Grand Forks. Yeah, yeah. And that's North Dakota. So there's a steakhouse I like to eat at in Grand Forks, and there's a watering hole I like to go to <laughs> in Grand Forks. Yeah. And there's a bridge between the two. Yes, and, and you, told, you told us that great story about the bridge. That's what yep. I. Yep. Yep, I know, and it's, uh, I'll tell you too, for anyone too, if you want to understand, get a more idea about what Pierre's talking about, watch the show Fargo, because it's literally, it's they've either been on, on one side of that river or on the other, it, like all the seasons they've had. So uh, you'll get a better understanding of the geography there and, and what it's like there. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, that's another thing too. I mean, that's going to play a huge role that they have all those fans there. I think it's going to be a great game, Pierre. I think that one's a toss up. I give a little slight edge to North Dakota, but you a never little, know. What's happening. Little edge to Dakota. Yeah. They have a transfer goalie um, from Miami of Ohio, and and he could be he could be the difference maker. We'll see. We'll see how it plays out. We'll see. All right. So that's what we got left in college hockey right now, and then the regional finals will start up tomorrow, and then there'll be more on Sunday as well, and then they'll be set for the Frozen Four. Pierre, let's switch over the NHL last night, yes. and. Uh, uh, let's start in Montreal. Um, I knew you were going there. I knew you were going there. You were all jacked up last night. I know. I was calling I the phone saying, give me score updates. I score updates. Yeah. And and then, I gave you the wrong one because they called oh, the goal. Back. Okay. So sometimes <laughs> stuff happens. And I was like, Philly might come back then. If they, and then Jimmy called, text me. You texted me back. Yeah. And he said, uh, yeah, no, Philly, that goal was disallowed. <laughs> I was laughing. And then, and then Montreal pulled away after yeah, that. They took off. How yeah. good is Nick Suzuki, Jimmy? Is oh, Nick Suzuki any good? He's having the most quiet, great year in the NHL, in my opinion. It's Joe Sackick. I'm just yeah. telling you. This guy's yeah. Joe oh, that's a great. That's a great comparison. I like that's it. This is Joe Sackick. I like it. But, Pierre, let's go here. And, I, you know, we, we had our daily prep talk when I was driving back today. Um, actually driving to have lunch with my daughter. 
Maddie, and and I and I said to you, I said, Pierre, a lot of people lost a lot of money on Philly last night because that was like one of those you just circle it like this is a great spot for them. Right. And Montreal just blew that right out of the water. What is up with Philly to be that flat in that spot there? Yeah, that's I mean, just I one of those nights, probably, I guess. Probably fatigue more than anything mm-hmm. else. And the other guys are playing and having fun. You know, yep. they, think about Montreal. They go on, they, they have a tough road trip, but they play every game hard. They win in Seattle. Yep. Win in Colorado, and a lot of that was divine intervention, but still they won the game. They got it done. Yep. Then they're coming home feeling high about the way they're playing, and they know they have Philly, and they want to play the role of spoiler. So they mm-hmm. played really well. And, you know, they beat Philly last night 4-1. And, you know, I felt I felt bad for Torch, but I was happy for the Canadians. I was happy for the – do you see the reaction of some of the fans after goals? It was oh, yeah. It was so good. Yeah, they're not even going to playoffs, but they're, it's like a playoff environment. And Pierre, ironically, in the process of beating Philly – Montreal put the Bruins, their arch rivals, in the playoffs. <laughs> well, you're going to have to explain this one to me. Now, I know Varlamov was really good last night for the yeah. honor. I watched that game this morning, earlier this morning. But I don't know how Florida doesn't win that game. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how Florida doesn't win that game. Uh, there were moments there. And I, I think, I don't know if you heard uh, what, what happened with the Maurice uh, postgame presser. Did you hear what he did? Mm-hmm. He's- yeah, so he comes out and he just says he was mad. He was very mad. He said, look, I'm not even going to bother. Just insert, quote, whatever, and pretend I said it, and I said it. And it was great. I mean, it was it went viral when he did it, but that was it. It was They just had these lapses within the – it was a close yeah. game in the scoreboard, but there were times where Florida was just – they just looked disinterested. And well, I don't know if maybe fatigue's setting in with them. That little third period against Boston the other night, we were talking about it when we were watching the game together. I was like, you know, there's a problem here. That being said, so that was a tough one for Florida. Good for the Islanders. They stay alive a little bit. Um, yep. Can you explain Detroit? No. Lose I can't. Carolina for nothing? Could you explain that? I, I mean, Carolina is a great team, but the, Detroit needs to have more desperation, more purpose out there. Pierre and I, you know me, I watch Detroit a lot. I, I'm worried. Very worried. Like a few weeks back, everybody's saying, oh, they're going back to the playoffs. It's great for the NHL. It's great for the city of Detroit. You know, I think a lot of people kind of counted their eggs before they hatched there. Well, they lost Larkin for two and a half weeks. I get it. But But he's been back now. He's been back. back, There's one guy that's doing this a lot. You know it is? Murray Sider. Yes. Yes. Yep. One he's game he seems good, very passionate. He's too good a player not to be taking charge of some of these games. He's too good a player. Yep. So I don't know. If he might be playing. Like the one thing, that Jimmy, I've always cautioned about this. The one thing you got to be careful of this time of the year, a lot of guys might be playing hurt. And mm-hmm. so you wonder why they're not giving more. I so I'm really careful. True. Yeah. You can't yep. be going crazy on guys because you just don't know. And um, I don't know whether he is or he isn't. Uh, but I know one thing. In order for them to be better as a team, he needs to be better as a player. Yeah, that's what I know. I do too. And you know, one thing I think though, even even when he is on Pierre, I still don't like the makeup of that blue line as a whole for Detroit. I think they're sort of missing some some elements, so to speak, that would improve them there. And uh, I wonder what happens. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but in the off season, if that's something that you know Stevie Y has been kind of keeping close tabs on and maybe shuffles the deck a bit on that blue line. Uh, it just doesn't seem cohesive enough, if that's the proper word. Yeah, that's fair. Hey, are you worried at all about Winnipeg? No, no, I know. I mean, that sounds crazy, but I'm not. I think that team, I think they just have hit a wall a bit. Another case of fatigue, but I do think that they are built for playoff hockey. And I think they get in. They'll turn it on. I do. I think that's one of those teams that will turn it on. Think about Vegas now. Vegas goes in there and they win. Oh, and Logan Thompson. Don't have, hey? Hurt, don't have Tomas Hurdle. Yep. They don't have Alex Petrangelo. When they had those two guys, and they don't, they didn't have Aiden Hill last night. And by the way, Logan Thompson played really well in goal. He has stepped up. He has been amazing. He stepped up. He deserves a lot of credit. But I'm looking at it. I'm going. Wait till they get those two guys back. Yeah. And by the way, Noah Hannafin, he's good. I know oh, it's yeah. a flash. Yeah. 
I know it's a newsflash. To all the Bruins fans that say they didn't need him and whatever. Oh. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that why is, is that why Jim Montgomery is uh, shuffling his top four this late into the season? Did you see that, by the way? Yeah. yeah. He broke up uh, the Lindholm Carlo, which he's had together the whole. That's the only pairing that's stuck together all year, and all of a sudden he's breaking it up, and so that just shows you that he's not happy with what he's got there. So, um, you know who's got to be happy? Peter Laviolette. Oh, They're finding different ways to win all the time. Yep. The Rangers yep. and they're going to Colorado. You sh- shut down the McKinnon scoring streak. You win the game three. By the way, McKinnon got screwed there on that point, though. No, it doesn't matter. He, I know, I know, but that was, that was tough. <laughs> I wanted to see him that point streak. I don't, keep going. I don't get it. But, I mean, the Rangers are doing it in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. dynamic. I said it to you earlier this week. They're one of the most dynamic teams in the NHL, and I think uh, that's why they they could make it to the final. I really do. I'm, we've said it a long time ago, but at the start of this show, and I'm going to say it again. There's certain guys in the league that don't get enough credit. Laviolette deserves credit because of what happened with Rempe. Mm-hmm. I think he made a huge adjustment as a staff, and that's on Peter. He deserves a lot of credit for that. But the guy that's not getting enough credit there is Michael Pekka. From where the Rangers were a year ago on faceoffs, yeah. where the Rangers are now. It's unreal. Jimmy, apple and orange, just telling yeah. you. I know. Apple and orange, big difference. And and Michael's done a masterful job there. He's a Trocek is way better. Savannah Jad is way better. Mm-hmm. Harley Goodrow, when he takes him, he's fine. I mean, I'm just telling you, Michael's made a big difference there. I, like he was an assistant coach in Rochester last year. I know. I know. He's he's brought a he's he's done great, Pierre. And uh, you know, I'll tell you, and we're not gonna yeah, name- Sabres is my point. Yeah. Oh, wait, one second, though. Out of respect to the player on the University of Denver, I won't name him, but uh, the, the University of Denver could have used Michael Pecker, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know you're, well, yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> game. You're just being a UMass guy now. <laughs> the game. Give him credit. Give Coach Carl a lot of credit. They won the they game. Did. It was a good game. Um, but, no, Michael Peck has been great there, and I think he's on his way eventually to a, a head job. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question, Jimmy. So – Rochester is 45 to 50 miles from Buffalo. Mm-hmm. New York is about 340 miles. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't figure out in Buffalo that he might have been able to help their team a little bit. He was yeah. in their system. I don't I, know. Why, I don't get why you let that guy go. I know. Because I think, well, I'm not going to get into it, but Buffalo's got some issues. We'll talk about that another time. We'll talk about that another time. Pierre, another team, and I'm, I tried to get a guest on from them. We're going to work on that for next week that I want to talk about, and they lost last night, and I, I'm i just having trouble figuring them out because the L.A. Kings. Mm, now, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat about them. You don't but sweat about that one? Change. I think the coaches are – Coach Hiller's doing a good job. DJ's – real look at – I know people in Ottawa are mad at DJ Smith. I'm telling you right now, that guy can coach. I've been yeah. in, I've been in the bunker with him. He can coach, and he's sharp. He's passionate, and he really cares about his players. I'm telling mm-hmm. you, and Jim Hiller's the same. It's not this isn't about. Co- I just think they're tired too. They had to over. Remember at the beginning of the year when they were just running rough shot over the league, especially with yes. their games. They were yep. just torching everybody on the road. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a toll to pay for that at the end of the year or at some point during the year. They're yeah. paying the toll now. Yeah. They're what do you the- think of the goaltending, though? Well, we talked about that when Copley went down with his knee. Mm-hmm. And I, I was kind of surprised. Maybe they tried. I know on March, or maybe they tried on oh, March. from Boston. Maybe they tried. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether they did or didn't. But the one guy that's out there that's winning games, Jake Allen. Oh, yeah. Just how many times have we talked about Jake? Oh, gosh. A lot, right? Even if New Jersey got him earlier. What? Okay. So I'm going to get 20, 20. I know. Tommy's going to get a pass there, Tommy Fitzgerald, because he really – he was all in on Markstrom. So you can't fault him there. What should have happened, though, somebody internally probably should have said to him, okay, if you can't get this guy, like we're treading water here and we're starting to take on water. That guy's right there for the taking. We like, gotta get him, and it's the price point's good. We gotta, we gotta make this deal. 
So if you can fault Tommy on one thing, it would be that. But I don't fault him on trying to do the Markstrom thing. I don't fault. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody should either. But yeah, and by the way, Jersey as a whole, and and we can talk about it another time. But big picture wise, Pierre, I, I this may sound crazy right now. I think this year is actually a, a blessing in disguise in the long run for the, a lot of the young kids on that team. I I, I think that people didn't. They've got so much skill. After what they did with that series, they beat the Rangers last year. I think maybe everyone, them, the media, the fans, we got a little ahead of ourselves when we were talking about New Jersey. You were the one of the few people that cautioned people on that, saying it takes time to take those building steps and those make those building blocks. And I think that's what this year exemplified. I, I think it was – it was a growth year and, and it's, it's tough. It's horrible to go through in the moment. And I know the expectations were high, but I think they come out of this, a better team going forward in the long run. They weren't good enough in goal. You yep. know, they tried to trust their in-house guys and they just couldn't get it done. Uh, you know, that sometimes that happens. You're just, yeah. too, I'll never forget. I'll never forget talking to a really legendary hockey executive at the Hockey Hall of Fame, believe it or not, we were there at the, the induction ceremony. This was probably around 10 years ago before mm -hmm. I had the good fortune of being put on the committee. And I, I remember we were talking, and he said, if I had one fundamental flaw as an executive, is I was extremely loyal, and sometimes I was blinded by loyalty. He said, in, in the case of a lot of the young managers in the league, that happens too often. And he says, I wish I could counsel them, but I'm afraid to. Now, he was no longer involved in the game. You know, he's a retired person. But it was such a good quote. I was really – it was something that always stuck in my head. And I'm going to say it was 10 to 12 years ago. I'm going to say closer to 10 than 12. But it was it was something I will always remember what he said. And he wasn't being mean, saying, I overpaid this guy or I kept this guy. It's just I should have been better prepared to deal with older players or younger players that weren't producing. Yep. That's, Good point. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, looking ahead to the weekend, Pierre, I mean, a lot could be decided by Monday. A lot yeah, of things. Not, nothing's getting decided. No, there's only one game, but there's a lot of good college on it. Yep. Yeah. But gonna start, be starting tomorrow around 12 o'clock, there's a lot going yep. on. There is, both in the NHL and NCAA. And I'm just looking ahead to tomorrow, Pierre. Yep. And, and one game that I'm looking at, it's a day game, two games actually in a day that really have – Huge implications playoff-wise. Start off at 12.30. You've got the Red Wings at the Panthers. And then at 3.30, 3 Golden Knights at the Minnesota Wild. So two games right out of the gate there. They're going to be big. you got the Preds and the Avs are playing at 6. Uh, Leafs and Sabres. That's always – I know the Sabres are pretty much out of it, but that's always a fun game. It's It doesn't matter where they are in the standings. Hurricanes and Canadians would be a good one to watch as well. Uh, and then you look at the Islanders, Lightning's a huge one, Bruins Capital. That's, that's, that one counts. Islanders, Tampa counts. Yep. Montreal, not really. Buffalo, not really. Washington Bruins does. Washington, Boston counts. That could be a playoff preview right there. Time. Absolutely. Yeah. That counts big time. So there, there are some that really count. Absolutely. The early ones count. Detroit of Florida counts a lot. Yep. And you know what? I, I will say this about Vegas. I know Minnesota's just hanging on, and, and a great job by Matt Boldy last night, uh, mm -hmm. Minnesota in their 3-1 win. But uh, Johnny Hines, I know people were, well, what is he going to – Johnny Hines has changed the dynamic in Minnesota. Yes. Yeah. Well, they, they were chasing from a long way back, but he's done a good job there. Johnny's done yes. a good job. Yes. Yeah. All right. You know what, Pierre? Let's open it up. We're already at quarter of five. I didn't even realize where the well, time was. flies when you're having fun. I hope people were not always have fun here. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. All right. Let's open it up to the questions. What do we got? Vincent Yoyal says, hello, gentlemen. Have you seen NHL clubs spend more resources scouting for college hockey or have deals like Adam Fox spook the big clubs? Also, what Canadian college should fans keep an eye on? Pierre, I'll let you take it. Oh, well, first of all, I don't think Adam Fox's deal spooked anybody. I think most people are looking at that saying, boy, Lane Hudson might be the next Adam Fox, and he's owned by Montreal. Oh, there's so many players. Um, you know, I think there's 100 – I could be wrong, but I think it's like 142 draft picks playing just in the NCAA tournament. Wow. Yeah, it's something like 142, I think, just playing in the NCAA tournament. So there's a lot. And there, 
the one thing that I can tell you again, when you and I were at the rink yesterday, mm -hmm. a lot of the guys were saying is more assets are going into college free agent scouting mm -hmm. um, because they think that there's a lot of players that are being developed because they're coming in at 20 or 21 yes. rumors and they can get them at a cheaper price mm -hmm. because of the cap and they're not burning years on them. So that's a good way to look at it. So I'd say, no, nobody's scared off from the college guys in the States. Nobody at all. I'd agree. And he also asked a Canadian college to look at. I don't know much about Canadian college hockey here, so I can't. Well, <laughs> there's a bunch of them that are really good. Uh, you know, you can look at uh, Dalhousie used to be really good uh, under Warren Young. I just go down the line. Western used to be good. University of Toronto used to be really good. Uh, McGill used to have a real good program. I mean, but they're to say out uh, University of Alberta, uh, University of Saskatchewan. I mean, there, there are tons of good programs. I mean, I don't know what you're looking for, players or just quality of play. I don't know, but there are a lot of good programs. Guys, I want to go to a question over here. It's at the bottom there from 87 Eagles. I want to bring this up right away here. Pierre, look at this. 87 Eagles is saying he heard something on Twitter come from Danny Dubé and Martin McGuire from a radio station in Montreal that said it's not a guarantee that Montreal will sign Hudson. Well, first of all, they're both really good. They work on the radio show in Montreal, um, and they're outstanding. And no, no relationship between Martin McGuire and, and me. Sam yep. Sterling, though, which is amazing. It's actually, um, a good Irish tune, actually. He's a, he's a Frank. He's a Francophone Irishman, which is amazing. <laughs> but he's a tremendous broadcaster and a great. Yeah, guy. I love talking to those guys. Dubé, I don't know if you know this, Jimmy, because it's probably a little before your time. Danny was a really good goalie. And Danny, Danny was a very, very good coach in the media. Oh, all right. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was very good. I just know Danny in the media business. That's it. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. So I'm just letting you know. He's got some street cred in the hockey world. Oh. Danny um, I think his last big game coaching was the 94 World Championships. He worked um, for Team Canada. They won in Bolzano, Italy. So that was okay. Danny, Danny coaching there. Um but I have not heard that. I would be shocked if if Lane Hudson doesn't get signed by Montreal. I'll be shocked. I'm yeah, shocked. yeah, I would be shocked too. I mean, anything's possible, but I I think it's almost if that if he doesn't get signed, I I don't know what they're going to do because then maybe he says, "Really, you don't want to sign me? I'm going to go for four years to be you, and then I'm going to be a free agent, and I won't pay taxes in Canada." Yep. <laughs> there you I go. Know. I mean, yeah. I, I, they don't want to mess with that. Okay, I'm just going to put my hand up right now and say this: Stop. Mm -hmm. Cutter Goche is in Anaheim right now because Philadelphia wouldn't sign him. Yes. When he wanted to sign. So mm -hmm. you don't want to play that game if you're Montreal? Don't think that's wise. Don't no. Think that's wise. And I, I think I think Montreal is very wise, so I don't see the so do I. So do I. All right. Next question. Alex Evanowski, here's a million dollar question. When does the next wave of young teams out east assert themselves and take playoff spots from some of these older established teams? Detroit makes me sick. <laughs> it uh, makes me sick. My allergies to these fans. <laughs> uh, I'd say look for Ottawa. They're going to have a coaching, you know, change. Um, that's not a knock on Jock or Daniel Alford. No, it's already playing. Toronto. That's just new ownership. They're just going to – and they yeah. brought them in just to be caretakers this year. They did. Um, yeah. So they'll, they'll make a coaching change. I think Ottawa will come out of the gates really well next year. They should. Um I don't know what Buffalo's doing, Jimmy. You would know probably better than I. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll be interesting to see what Buffalo does next year. Talking about younger teams taking a step up. And uh, I still believe that Detroit is going to be very, very good. They, I think way too the much. they got way too much coming. Yeah. I, I almost think Detroit was better this year than maybe they, a lot of people thought they were going to be. They were a little ahead of schedule, and now it's kind of – evening out a bit so well simon, I'm giving you, simon edmondson played last night he's been playing for a while now carter mm -hmm. mazer's down in the american league you go watch grand rapids carter mazer good player um you know they've got the goalie trey augustine they just signed carter guy lander out of colgate i mean they, they've got depth at so many different positions detroit they got chips to play in the game too if they want to try to change their nhl team so sure. i no, i think detroit i think there'll be three teams knocking on the door next year legitimately where they're not bounced out by the middle of March. All right. All right. Next question. What do we have here? Justin LeBron. Some people are saying, why are people celebrating with 30 goals for Suzuki? What do you guys think? 
I mean, why are they celebrating? Who are these people? <laughs> why wouldn't you celebrate it? <laughs> you want to get fed? People don't want to celebrate, you know, Zach Hyman. I don't. Why? Why don't you want to celebrate these things? Oh, uh, I don't know. I guess the pop. It's hard to please everybody. He's a really good player. It's all. He, he's amazing. He's sure. amazing. What a what a year he's having. All right, next question. Bill Van Vagel. Who do you think wins the OHL championship? Do you oh, think Jacob yeah. Oster gets drafted finally? No idea. No, yeah, idea. I, no I haven't idea. paid attention enough to answer that. I apologize. Oh, I wish I could give you a good add on. No yeah, idea. but we're honest, right? We're not going to try and make things up like some people do. So, all right, next question. Steve Rosen. I know everyone is saying that the Sharks won't be competitive for a long time, but if they have Will Smith, Quinton Musty, David Edstrom, and maybe Celebrini, how can you say they're that far away? Well, I think Celebrini is a game changer, obviously. First of all, Celebrini, we've said it the other day, yeah, we, game changer. Yeah, Musty, you, you can say whatever you want about Quentin Musty. He's a good player. He's a first-round pick, but he's got a ways to go. Um, you know, Will Smith's tremendous. He's 172 pounds. I mean, we think the world of these players. We haven't said anything wrong about those players. We think they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> The, the highway's been littered by a lot of teams rushing young players into the NHL that aren't ready physically. And, and Pierre, I think we've both agreed on numerous occasions, too, with San Jose, too, that one of the issues, too, that we think needs to be addressed is sort of building, bringing in better veterans around those those younger players to help with the culture and the mentoring. So that's one of the things that I think they need to focus on in the offseason. All right, next question. I think they will. Yeah, I think they realized that it didn't get off the way they wanted it to go. And I think they will start to address that. All right. Next question. Alex Evanowski, how you doing, Alex? Also Columbus. I know talent is on the way to already go with what they have, but why are they still so bad? They look so lost defensively. It makes you wonder how good or bad are their goalies. I think that's one of the problems. The question. I think you nailed it right. I think you answered your question, Alex. I think you got it right there. there. Um, you know, Berensky's really good on defense. But you They've think about it, this, is, this is a team. Like, okay, so think about this. Seth Jones is in Chicago. Gavrikov is in L.A. And Peak is in Boston. Uh, Boston. Those, that's just three guys off their roster. Yep. So do you think defensemen just fall off trees? I saw the other day Christensen was called up from uh, Lake Erie. He's a good player, but he's an offensive guy. I've watched yeah. him a ton in the American League. He's a really good player, but he's an offensive guy. He's not a defensive guy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're deciding how they're going to build their team. But I would say this, whomever the new GM is there, I think there'll be a concentrated effort on addressing the defense. I agree. I agree on that. We will see, too, because we'll see who that GM may be. Um, before I go on to the next question, I uh, want to remind everybody of our sponsors here. Pull up Manscaped, please. And our, our, our good friends at Manscaped, uh, the season, this season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Go to manscaped.com and use the code ITEST for 20% off and free shipping. Again, Go to manscaped.com and use the code ITEST for 20% off and free shipping. A pair, I'll be transparent, brought brought the Manscaped box with me on the road recently, and uh, <laughs> it fell out in the lobby. <laughs> but it was free advertisement. They, this guy says, what's Manscaped? And so, of course, I told him about this and was able, hopefully, to get them a subscription. So who knows? <laughs> it happens for a reason, I guess. <laughs> That's good, Jim. I tried to turn an embarrassing moment into something good. That was, so there good. We go. that was excellent. And, and our other uh, great sponsor, of course, is Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. Head to factormeals.com slash itest50 and use the code itest50 to get 50% off. Again, that's factormeals.com slash itest50 and use the code itest50 to get 50% off. And like I keep telling you, with so much hockey going on, Day hockey, night hockey, college, NHL. Why take time away from those games? You know, I know you can DVR and all that, but why take time away from the games? You got that, pop it in a microwave, keep watching while it heats up, and voila, you've got a great factor meal, a great healthy meal to mow down while you are watching all this hockey. All right, let's go on to the next question. Bill Van Vegel again. How do you think UNB compares to top NCAA games? They Sorry, were phenomenal. They're under, just so you know, 
They're undefeated. That's in Fredericton, New Brunswick. That's who he's probably wondering okay. about. And they play at the Aitken Center. That's where the Montreal Canadiens used to have their farm team. All right. In Fredericton. I, I saw I some that. guys go through there, and one of them was Donald Brashear. <laughs> he was <laughs> tough. Um, he's just a little tough. You know what? They're, they're an amazing team. Um, I was talking to a good friend of ours, Shane Malloy, yesterday, who lives right outside Fredericton. Oh, yeah. And uh, Shane was telling I said, Shane, where are they getting all their players? He goes, oh, they're all major junior guys. Um, and they've got a heck of a program there. They're, they're undefeated. I mean, where would they fit? I don't know. They'd probably fit in well. Um, yeah. But, you know, again, you don't know just because a lot of them have never experienced pro hockey. Somehow, mm -hmm. somehow, by the way, that's the difference between U.S. and Canada. You could play pro hockey and still go back and play mm -hmm. Canadian college hockey. Yeah can't do in the United States, but they've got an amazing team. And they've done an outstanding job there. Really, really good. And that is Jimmy, that whole area of the Maritimes, Fredericton, St. John, Moncton, Halifax, you drive and go all through there. It's just untrue. Um, it's a, we're Acadia, Wolfville. You go through all there. Jimmy, I used to go through there all the time. And it's better in the summer than the winter, let me tell you. Oh, I bet. I bet. I bet. This is yeah, where we're there. But, um, yeah, no, there's there's some magical hockey players that come out of there. The hockey from there is really good. That's a great question. And UMD is really good. Love that they bring it up. All right, next question. John Smith, I just did some manscaping. Well, there we go, my friend. Good for you. Great products. Yes, they are. Who do you think is the playoff dark horse? Go first, Jimmy. I, that's a good question. I would say Nashville, but everybody's kind of talking about them right now. So I don't know if that's really fair to categorize them as a dark horse. Does Carolina count as a dark horse? What's that? Does Carolina count as a dark horse? No. I I mean, when I well, I think it's it, it depend it depends how you define dark horse. When I think dark horse, I'm thinking like a team that can sneak up on people and everybody's not talking about, but has a really good team. I see. I don't think Carolina is sneaking up on anyone. No, see, so I was going to say Carolina in the East and Dallas in the West because I don't hear anybody talk about Dallas. Okay, all they now, do is Dallas. Oh my God, I'm so glad you brought that up here. All I'm they so do is glad you brought that up. Dallas just crush it. They beat Winnipeg or Vancouver last night, three one. I know it was yeah. late in the game, but they still won the game. And Jake Jake Ottinger, last night he stopped 22 of 23 shots. Right in you. Yep. I know. Don't worry. I know who he is. <laughs> right up to you. And, and I want to say before we go on, and, and we'll talk about it maybe Monday, let's just set the table for it too. Because I listen to our good friend Jeff Merrick, which I do a lot driving today, and a caller called in and said, why is Pete DeBoer never mentioned in the Jack Adams conversation? Oh, good call. Great call. And and he didn't necessarily said, look, I get this year because everybody, you know, like they were picked by a lot of people to go to the finals or at least the conference final. But he talked about last year, Pierre, there weren't that high expectations when he took over in Dallas and he went in there and, and he brought up a great point. He went and looked at the math and he said that apparently he, DeBoer did a great job for the majority of the season, game by game, never letting a player play more than 25 minutes and really just managing the bench, managing ice time. Great. And, and he said, that's coaching. That's, that's bench work. That's, that's what it's about. And, you know, Marek's retort to that, or it might've been Friedman. And I agree with them is a lot of times the Jack Adams were at least in the last few years seems to be that team that comes out of nowhere, like Vancouver. Right. I mean, uh, not to take away what Rick Hawkins doing. Nashville, Vancouver, Nash Philly, yeah. Philly, the playoffs. Exactly. Yeah, I get it. I get it. The board deserves a lot of credit. He really no, does. Peter does. Here's the one. You talk about ice time in Dallas. You know who the number one example is? Ryan Suter. Yes. Last night, Ryan Suter, I think, played 16 and a half to 17 minutes. Look it up, Jimmy, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll pull it up right now. Once I was studying it this early this morning. Because Suter, when he was playing, especially in Minnesota and Nashville, we're talking about 28 to 31 minutes a game. And I think he was he was definitely below 20 last night, but I'm going to say he was closer to 17 minutes last night. Let's see. Ryan Suter, you, you, you're 58 seconds off. 17, 58, 19 shifts here. So I'm telling you, there's Exhibit A. Yep. Suter. Yeah. He's, he's had such a great year. Really good year. All right, let's do one more question here. Uh, Ryan's a really good player. I'm just telling you. He, 
You so can't play in the contract. Meet these, like I, the first time I met Ryan Suter was playing at Culver Military Academy, okay? Oh, wow. Playing at Culver Military Academy. And then the next time I spent time with him, he was carrying a skate sharpening machine out of the uh, auditorium in Halifax during the 2003 World Junior. He was wow. playing for Team USA. The two guys carrying the skate sharpening machine were Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter <laughs> on the rink on New Year's Eve after they lost to Canada. Good so there you go. Like, it just shows you where you get to meet these guys and where, where their careers start. That's good stuff. Good roots. A good root story there. All right. One more question here. What do we got? Entertap says, do you both want to venture a guess for your winner of the heart, especially if McDavid gets 100 assists? I, I'm staying with McKinnon. McKinnon, please. McKinnon. There we go. Oh, and that's not a knock on Connor at no, all. Not Connor's not a knock on other plays. That oh, might no. Austin Matthews, it's not a knock on him. No. You know, it's not a knock on any of those guys. It's just Nathan's been. Oh, he's on the, the problem, you know, Part of the problem, though, Jimmy, is, look, I know they're not on the total. They're not in Pacific time zone. They're in mountain time zone. A lot of people just don't stay up to watch those games. No. It's, it's fine. I get it. you got to work. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, not like, enough people see it. Yeah. You don't, you just, you read about it. You might see the highlights, but you don't see the day in and day out what this guy does. He's, yeah. And he's, the way he, he motivates people on the bench too. Like it's just. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he has different, different methods. Let's yeah. Play. He's a bulldog. He's a bulldog. All right. Good, good show today. Great week as always. Again, thanks to everyone that made our Springfield show at the top at the MGM Casino. A great success to UMass and all the teams that are there at that Springfield Regional. Really appreciate all the great people we met. Thank you for saying hi. Uh, it, it really is a joy. Uh, Pierre and I were saying it. We're going to really start to make these remotes uh, more of a regular thing. We really love coming out and meeting you people out there and talking hockey and, and, and just getting the the vibe and, and it was it was just so so much fun Pierre. Jimmy, I just want to say hi to two friends of ours that are really battling right now. Rosa, we are all thinking of you, Rosa. Keep kicking Derriere. You're doing awesome. And Tony Granado, we're all thinking about you. You're doing so well right now. Get near the end of the line here in a positive way. Keep it up, Tony. And happy Easter to everybody. We're really thinking of you. For sure. For sure. Great stuff. And again, yes, I echo that as well. And happy Easter to all out there. And for Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. This has been another edition of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Eye Test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.